Chris for tonight. We've got Scott Murphy. He's in the art show. His booth number is 16. I hope I'm, yeah, I'm afraid I'm reading it backwards. Steve Argyle, he is just outside the art show. Booth five, or area 571. All right, Tyler Walpole. He is in the art show, booth 19. Woo! Drew Baker, the champion of the weekend. He has been here all three nights. Booth 571, along with the Troublemaker Island with Steve Argyle. All right, Tom Babby, booth 13. And Aaron. Aaron's booth 12. Basically, if you look at this, you just walk down this one aisle, it's all these artists, except, and then and Steve and Drew are over. Go visit them. And last but not least, we have Tappy Toe Claws. Sydney is our model tonight, and we really appreciate that. Um, and so, yeah, she'll be sitting that. Uh, speaking of, I'm going to set a timer. What we'll be doing the format tonight is um, it's a three hour session. We cut it up into hour long pieces, uh, give the model a break, and um, it's actually another way that the artists can actually time box their pieces. Um, by uh, what they do in the first hour is they kind of get shapes down and get a little bit of color down. The second hour they then go on. Sorry, I'm trying to set this timer. Do it. Um, and then the second hour they start to get that light and dark and work on that. And then the last hour they work on the details a lot of times. Now things can always change there, but that's generally how a lot of the portrait painting sessions work. I believe we're only doing the stream for the first two hours, but our studio audience can get to watch the last hour of that. If you guys on the stream want to see the last final pieces when it's finished, uh, you can go and check out the artist's booths. That's why I'm telling you the booth numbers. Hopefully they also might post them on their social media. Um, another comment on that. Uh, some of these pieces might be for sale tomorrow if you are interested in these pieces, but sometimes when an artist is doing something and they feel and they get working on it, it might not quite work out and they aren't happy with it so they don't want to sell it. Uh, we'll start to talk to the artists a little more throughout the show to see how they're feeling on it, but a lot of these pieces might be for sale tomorrow if you're interested. So uh, I'm going to apologize to all the artists too. I will get in your way. If you need me to move, yell. Artists only. No, just Actually, speaking of, thank you for the point. If you guys in the studio audience, or if you're able to on the Twitch, on uh, Twitch and stuff, feel free to art along. We actually had people in the um, audience before doing sketches and everything like that. Feel free. Our whole point here is that art makes life better. We want everyone. I don't care if all you can do is stick figures or anything like that. Feel free to go out and do some art. We hope this inspires you and uh, makes things uh, a lot better in your life. So, we're gonna start out by kind of interviewing some of the artists and seeing what medium they're working on and what panels they're working on so that you guys can kind of get an idea of what everyone's doing. Um, the great thing that I think you guys will start to see and I'll keep enforcing throughout the night is the different perspectives. We're all looking at the exact same thing and yet all of these different images are gonna be very, very unique and I love it. And even just what they're working with and how they work is unique, and so that's why I like to ask every artist what they're doing. All right, Aaron, you're my first victim. <laughs> what is your, uh, what are you painting in today and what are you painting on today? Painting in oil and I'm painting on masonite. All right, are you picky about your masonite? Do you do, you do your own masonite boards or? Yep, I, I have them cut for me and then I gesso my own. Is that a cost saving or is that like pickiness or both? Uh, cost savings. Okay, I like it. I know that we've been painting sometimes and like I'll try a new board and I'm just like, oh, I can't stand this. So I can understand doing your own boards too. You always know what you got. How do you set up your board for your painting? Uh, how do you set up your palette? Oh, my palette? Uh usually have warm on top and cool on the side and uh, helper colors on the left and garbage on the bottom. Garbage, it's out! 
<laughs> yes, we're using our technical terms tonight. Did you guys hear Aaron okay? Are we getting that on the mic? Okay. For me, I'm, it's like probably a good thing I'm not hearing it up here, so it's freaking me out a little. All right, you're next. Yes. Say the question again. <laughs> Uh, what is your medium and what are you painting on? Uh, oil paint, um, and I'm painting on just a gessoed masonite panel that I did. Um, masonite I usually just get from Home Depot and cut up because it's, it's basically just cooked, you know, board with linseed oil cooked into it, so it's all good. All right, and how do you set up your palette? Um, right now I'm actually using a very limited palette of, you know, it's kind of, some people used to call it a Zorn palette. Uh, it's pretty much black, white, um, a very bright red, a yellow ochre, um, and that's it. I'm adding like three extra colors just because there's a few others in there that I might want to punch up later. Um, but since I'm working travel style right now, I'm trying to keep it simple and easy. Makes sense. All right, Argyle. What, uh, what are you painting in today? Mine's done. This is all. done. Was it oil? Is it, yeah. um, I'm uh, painting an oil on a, uh, a linen panel. How do you set up your uh, palette there? Oh, uh, poorly, randomly. Um, I remember this color. I'm gonna put it over here. So, um, well, I would love to do a limited palette because it's more challenging and there's a lot of interesting things. I'm. I am paletting for convenience, which is, I, I really just put out as many colors as I can find so that I don't have to mix as much and I can be faster. All right. Drew, what are you painting with tonight? Hi, I'm painting with oils. Oh, one uh, particular thing about this batch of oils I'm uh, using is that I don't really like them. And one of the, the difficult things to get over as an artist is to use enough paint. And because these aren't my favorite, I'm, I'm not shy at all about just squeezing big blobs out and uh, using it with reckless abandon. Is that what I need to do to paint thicker? I need to just find some paint. I'm like, I hate this stuff. Let's use it up. Hate, you can't hate it. It can be, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. And then what are you painting on? Oh, I'm, I'm painting on an aluminum composite panel uh, that I've primed with one layer of Michael Harding's non-absorbent acrylic ground and then a second layer that's Golden's acrylic gesso. Um, it, it mitigates some of the tooth, but it still lets the paint slide around. And uh, one thing I've learned, if you put some texture in the panel to begin with, then uh, it makes your uh, painting a little more lively, a little more easily. Definitely see that. See, now I have all the pointers on how to pit, like paint more thick and, and make it look like it's got all that texture because I can't do texture. I just have the hardest time. All right, Tyler, I'm going to reach across right here. Tyler, what are you painting with? Uh, I have a, just a hodgepodge of oils. I got a lot of Windsor Newtons and I'm using uh, some Gamsol Medium and, uh, oh, sorry, liquid. Sorry, that's what I'm using. What are you painting on? What am I painting on, Steve? You are also on Belgian linen. Oh, he's on Belgian linen. Mm -hmm. Pinky's out, guys, when you paint, when, when it's Belgian linen. Pinky's. Um, I didn't ask, Drew, how are you setting up your, you're setting up your palette actively. How are you doing that? What are you, how are you deciding to do that? Uh, I forgot what I was supposed to be doing and now there's paint on it and I'm trying to put it... But uh, value is the, one of the most important steps for me. Is you have light to dark and light to dark, whether it's the... And then by color family. So I've got my cool light to dark, I've got some warm light to dark, and my earth tones light to dark. All right. I'm going to sneak around over here and put this mic down. Sorry, I'm going to be doing this all night. And Tyler will finish our conversation right here. Uh, how do you set up your palette? Uh, well, in this case, just kind of randomly. I, uh, I, with all the prep for Gen Con, I kind of neglected to get ready for this as well as I should have. So I grabbed what I had from a workshop that I did a couple weeks ago with Jeff Miracola, which was awesome. And yeah, so then I just grabbed some warms and cools and some lights and darks and threw them now on there. Go. Yep. All right. I'm going to need to fix that a little later, Drew, but we'll get it. Don't worry about it. Tom, what are you painting with and what are you painting on? 
I am painting with uh, oil paints, specifically Windsor Newton brand. Uh, brand is one of my favorites. Uh, I'm also borrowing some of Aaron's paints. Uh, so there's some brands that I'm not familiar with, uh, and I'm painting on uh, Jesso Masonite board. Is that homemade also? It is, yeah. I'm not a fan of the uh, the store-bought Masonite. The store-bought can get a little too slick, and I kind of like that chalky feel that it absorbs the paint. So, uh, so I'm actually using Liquitex Basics Gesso. It's kind of a student grade gesso, and I like it actually a lot more than the, prof uh, the professional grade. Very nice, thank you so much. <laughs> All right, oh, you fixed it. That, that's probably good right there. Thank you. And I'll keep coming around, but. All right. Thank you guys. So yeah, and we'll also see, um, you'll notice some people are putting down a base color, um, Tom, and you guys will be able to see sometimes up on the screens. Uh, Tom's got kind of a brown background that he put in there. Some people are just painting straight on. Um, and, and you can see different styles and different uh, ways that people are applying things. Some people are doing the line outlines. Some people are getting your shadows and, and the shadow work in first, and that's how they're basing it. I'm going to scooch out here again. And you'll notice a lot of artists start with like a very neutral color and that neutral base to kind of start laying things down and like, like I said in the beginning you're just working on getting the shape in there. Um, we will be going to some audience questions in a little bit. If you guys have any questions start thinking about those and uh, we can ask those also. So. We're gonna just let them start, uh, get their base stuff down. Keep going. Thanks again, Sydney. It's a bit rough being the model sometimes. It seems like, yeah, I'm just sitting for uh, three hours. It, it's a little harder than it and than it looks, especially. And we, I, I don't believe you usually wear contacts for this cosplay, do you? Oh. So, so something I've been um, cluing them in on when I invite the cosplayers to sit for us is. Do not wear costume contacts when you sit for a portrait painting. Yeah, you might go in, through an eight hour day with those things in. It's much different when you actually have to sit. You just, I don't know why, you kind of just like forget to blink. I, I, but it will dry out and it hurts. <laughs> so we, we've been recommending that a lot. Uh, Sydney, is there a color, is there an eye color that's supposed to be for Ralph? So this works. You guys get a pick. There you go. And so that's what sometimes we'll do is we, we let the artist know what color the eyes are supposed to be because it's just torture to keep costume contacts in. All right. All right, gray usually for the artists. Yay! Thank you. I meant to, and I was telling myself five minutes before we started, hey, this is what you should start with. All right, there is a wonderful thing, and it's actually a theme to actually conventions, but it's the idea of consent. Whenever you are approaching a cosplayer, even out on the floor, ask consent to take pictures. They always appreciate it. Sometimes they're not feeling their best. You might think they look great and awesome, and they're not into it right then. Ask consent, especially what I feel bad for is when they're eating lunch, the cosplayers are like sitting there ducking down eating and people are like snapping pictures of them shoving a burger in their mouth. <laughs> or asking them to st stand up and take a picture. Ask consent. Same thing goes for artists. Some people might not know this and you'll see them walking around the art show just snapping pictures. Ask consent before taking a uh, picture of an artist's work. So, we're gonna actually do this right now for this and get this out of the way. Sydney. Do you have? Do people have your consent to take pictures tonight? Thank you. 
All right, and then we're gonna go to each of the artists. Aaron, can people take pictures of your painting tonight? Sure. All right, Drew? Yep. Scott? Sure. All right, we need verbal, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Steve? I have no shame, do it. Tyler? You have my consent. All right, Tom, you are good? Thank you. Um, it's just always, it's just common courtesy to take a, a to ask for that. Um, even at the end of the night, usually when we do a portrait painting night, the artist will still ask the um, person who is sitting for the photo if they can take a picture of them. Even though they've been painting them for three hours, they ask at the end of the portrait painting session, oh, if, can I take some pictures for follow-up? They still ask. It's just kind of that, like I said, common decency. And so I like to let other people know kind of how that works in, in that uh, situation. So thank you. And so you all have that consent. Ooh, we're getting some good color in here. Exciting. So um, Sydney is a trooper and I think a little bit of a masochist in that um, usually when we have people sit for a portrait painting, um, and by the way, Sydney, if you need to take a break early, you let me know. But uh, usually you don't do, this is a more complicated pose. I know it doesn't look that complicated, but usually back up against the wall, you're sitting. This is a bit more complicated. Your arms go to sleep and everything like that. She's a trooper. She did a similar one last year as her first pose, like for sitting for three hours and nailed it. So we appreciate that. All right, just to give the artists a heads up, I'm gonna be coming around and talking about how you start a portrait painting. Now this is gonna be very different and maybe we'll also ask a, like a tag on question there is, how is this different from what, when you decide to do a commercial painting? Because it's gonna be very different. But uh, how they start, what they're focusing on. Because like I said earlier, some people are doing some, some different work in here and that's, you'll, you'll start to see it diverge even more. It's great to see. I'm gonna start with Tom, so we'll go backwards. I do. I have travel music that everyone on the stream misses out on. It's just for the studio audience. We appreciate you. All right, Tom, how do you start your paintings? And um, how do you start a portrait painting? Uh, so usually what I'll do is uh, start by kind of uh, killing the white out of the canvas. Uh, it takes a lot of the intimidation out of the painting to get a stain down on the board. And I'll choose kind of a neutral, warm color for it. Uh, in this case, I'm using transparent earth uh, uh, paint on that. And then once I have that stain down, I go in and I start taking care of the line drawing. I figure out the planes of the head, I figure out the placement of the features, so I don't have to worry about those things when I start moving into opaque paint. So I can just focus on pulling my brush strokes once I get to the actual painting phase of it. How does this, and I know it, okay, maybe I shouldn't say how does it differ, but when you're gonna do a professional piece, how does it vary? What do you do when you're starting and getting ready and prepping to do a uh, commission piece? Gotcha. Yeah, so it's, what's funny about that is that there's actually a lot of parallels in the way that I work professionally uh, to the way that I work with my, uh, to my portrait pieces. So, but instead of uh, figuring out all of this in paint, the drawing phase in paint, what I'll do uh, for a professional piece, you figure out the thumbnail stage and the composition, then I figure out the tight drawing, which is essentially what I'm doing right now. So I'm solving the problem step by step by step. So with each step, I can focus entirely on those problems that are unique to that phase and give it my all. So I'm not trying to bite off more than I can chew per se. It's not intimidating. It's just, hey, this is the next step, step by step by step. Exactly, yeah, yep. I've heard lighting is very similar sometimes. And if, you, if you're scared of how to do lights and dark and shadow, just pick each light source and kind of work through those and what shadows they're casting. Yeah, oh, absolutely, yeah. So being mindful of where that light source is coming from and just focusing on that. And uh, like you said, figure out where each light source is coming from and focus on one at a time. Get the uh, form rolling in one direction and then figure out where that rim light's coming from like I have in this, uh, in this situation. I have a lot of rim light on the far side of this face that I'm gonna need to pop. But I wanna get the overall face and structure rolling first before I start popping that rim light and getting that really nice kind of glow to the far side of the face. Yeah, and it's a lot what we were talking about. You get the, the shapes down and then you'll figure the other. It, 
Step at a time. Yep. I love it. Don't get too scared, but get some paint down. Yep. All right, Tyler, how do you how do you start out uh, portrait painting? All right, so going after Tom, this is going to be an exercise in contrast. Tom has uh, been a painting instructor for a many, many, many years and has done a lot of this. This is literally the first time I've ever painted from a live model. That's awesome. To be honest, I kind of want a little bit of different point of views on what everyone's doing. That's what we're looking for here. I think that everybody has their own thing. Sometimes some, someone's style might not work for someone else. So tell us what you're doing and how you decided kind of where you're going. Uh, well, I can say it way less eloquently than Tom, but kind of the same idea of just going in and blocking in shapes and trying to get an idea of where I'm going to be putting things later. So right now is essentially the blueprint for where I want to go for me. Like having a road map before I start plopping down colors is really important. So. And that's part of the reason you're kind of working those neutral tones also? Yep, just trying to, just trying to get the base shadows right now. All right. Now, juxtapose that with how you do a uh, commission piece. How do you start out your commission piece? I imagine a little different than that. Well, the biggest difference is I do tons of thumbnail sketches before I start, so that roadmap gets established way early on in the game, so. What medium do you usually work in? Uh, well, I've done digital for years, but recently for magic pieces, I switched to doing oils. So. Very cool. All right, that's looking great, thank you. All right, going to scooch on over to Drew next. That was beautiful, Drew. Thank you. All right, Drew, how do you get your uh, portraits started? Well, uh, I actually know four or five different ways to get started. Um, Attacking it with sort of lines and blocking in shadow shapes is the most reliable way to do it quickly. And for a session like this, that's what I want. Uh, one way I prefer, if I have more time to develop the piece, is to have a, uh, a more toned panel and then just start, like, make a few landmarks and then start slapping color down and uh, just getting everything on the panel and then editing as you go. It's uh, It brings a different kind of energy to the piece. It's really exciting to... to watch it develop and then say, oh crap, I screwed up, and then edit it all back out. And uh, that that's another way that I really enjoy working. Uh, Do you change up the way you work just depending on maybe sometimes the person that's sitting for you? Yeah, yeah, it can depend on the lighting and the, the, the situation in the studio and the, the what I'm looking for in the final piece. But a big determinant is how much time I'll have to do it because I can't do build up a whole lot of color and a whole lot of editing in, uh, I'll, I'll say it, this is kind of a party trick, doing a, a painting this quickly. Uh, Have you ever seen the 20 minute artist? Come on, Drew. We want to do the magic trick once. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's exactly that thing, yeah. All right. Well, except those guys basically do the same image over and over again. This one's like, okay, here's a brand new image, a person you've never seen before, now paint. Um, how does this differ from um, your usual commission? And what do you do? How do you do your usual commission art? Yeah, I, like uh, Tyler said, the big difference is the thumbnailing stage at the beginning. I will, I'll do pages and pages and pages of thumbnails in my sketchbook to try to figure out the way I want to tell the story. And uh, testing variations at a you know, two-inch square is a lot quicker and a lot faster to ways to sort out your value scheme and your lighting and your your pose and your mood than doing a, a color piece for each one. Oh, your orange looks like it's gotten away from you. Run! Run, little orange, run! It's feeling neglected, it's running. All right, Steve Argyle. How do you start a portrait painting? Uh, usually what I'll do is I'll, I'll try and just figure out where things are going to be um, and work out some proportions, uh, though never very well because they always end up being a little bit off. That's why I'm practicing. Um, and then I, I will uh, usually do a big, broad color to try and uh, like not worry about detail, just get the mass gradients so that little color changes to like cheekbones and stuff uh, are, are in the big early stages. And then I'll work down to smaller and smaller brushes and details. All right, and how does this differ from how you usually work uh, for commissions? 
Well, this is way harder because for commissions, I just find like the right Photoshop filter and then I'm just done. You push the Argyle button on your Photoshop filter. Uh, for professional commissions, I uh, I do a ton and ton of thumbnails to get the kind of gesture right, the composition right, and then I will pick a few of those, flesh them out enough that like an art director can tell what they're looking at, or I can tell what I'm looking at, and uh, from there I just usually jump straight into color. I don't really have, to, I don't really refine the drawing too much, because um, then I feel like I'm just doing it again when I paint it. A lot of those, a lot of those details I'll figure out while I'm painting. Thank you. All right, Scott. How do you set up and how do you start on your? Uh, on, wow, it's coming along. You've got a lot of color on there. How do you start out uh, for your uh, portrait paintings? Um, I usually like. I mean, I don't do a ton of live portrait yeah. painting. Um, so this is definitely unique for me when I get to do this and it's a lot of fun. Um, I paint a lot outside from, you know, nature and stuff. Um, so I kind of use the same technique that I do there, uh, which is just start fast and loose. Um, try and just sketch everything out with, you know, loose colors, uh, much like everybody else, you know, figure out proportions. I'm kind of tending to spend a lot of time just pushing things back and forth to try and get like nose placement right and, and eye placement right and just make sure everything's set up before I start getting too involved in anything. Um, yeah, pretty much. It's just, it's mostly, it's mostly drawing with a paintbrush, you know, trying to just figure out those basics of, of where's the center line of the face, you know, where's the eye line, where's the, you know, where's the shoulder meeting up with the chin. Um, kind of finding those marking points that can help me to figure out, you know, this puzzle, basically, that we're looking at. Um, so it's a lot of fun. It's a little scary, but it's a lot of fun. <laughs> All right. How does this differ like, when you're just starting a professional commission? What, how do you start a professional commission? Are you finding the nose line and everything like that? Uh, it's certain points of it, yes, of course. Um, no, it's not how I start. How I start is very similar to what other folks said, which is, um, you know, thumbnails and thumbnails and thumbnails, studies, composition, figuring out the general shapes, especially if it's for a magic card, you know, I want the silhouette to read well, so I'm thinking about how, if it's a figure, how the figure fits in the, the card frame, it's going to read well, you know, when you're playing the game. Um, same goes for creatures or really anything, but uh, just compositionally figuring that out. And then, um, and a lot of time those are actually digitally for me. And then, uh, yeah, and then working through photo reference, um, sketching everything out, figuring out the details in the sketches. And then so when I finally actually get to be painting, it's almost like paint by number because I've already spent weeks on figuring out all the planning process. So when I get to go put paint down, um, I don't want to have to have, you know, I don't want any real big question marks. I want to know exactly what, where this piece is going. And, you know, in the final painting, it's more about finding, you know, adding those little embellishments that really make it click. Cool. Thank you so much. Ah. So uh, Drew actually is showing us, um, we have an example from his book. This is a page of his thumbnails. So I'm going to put the mic down so I can show this a little better, but this kind of shows that process to where he starts on his commissions, where these guys have all referenced doing th thumbnails, pages and pages. Um, they, all, they might do it a little different. Scott does his digitally. I believe Steve does his digitally also. But it's still the same idea where it's gestures. Sometimes you can't even understand what it is, but the artists kind of have their little shorthand to understand what they're doing.
Yes, Drew's, Drew's uh, notebook does kind of look like a, a, a madman's like journal. He writes uh, like that big all throughout and puts all these notes all throughout. But uh, but it's actually really interesting to look at. And he always has it on him. Everywhere I've ever seen Drew, he has his sketchbook on him. Which comes back to just everybody. If you want to get better at art, it's not that these guys have any special talent. It's not like they were given some sort of special gift. Talent is a four-letter word to some artists, actually. Because it, it, it underplays the work that they put into something and how hard they work to do that. Um, it's mostly that these guys have just been arting their whole life. Most of us start out doing artwork as kids, and then about like 12, we just stop. These guys just didn't stop. They kept doing it and they kept going. And that's again why I encourage even adults, hey, if you stop when you're 12, pick a pen back up, draw. Draw every day, just keep going and going and going and drawing, and that helps you progress. If you want to draw more, just like Drew, uh, Drew does, keep a sketchbook on you. Instead of playing on your phone, in those moments when you're like tempted to pull out your phone and play on that, pull out a sketchbook and do a five minute sketch. Or a sketch on your phone. Or a sketch on your phone. Steve does now, Steve got one of the new notes and he loves sketching on his phone. He's done some crazy stuff on that. Um, uh, Bob Ross actually started out as a, he was in the military and he wanted to paint. And so he became such a fast painter because he only had like 10 minute breaks. So he had to get in there and just paint as fast as he could as, um, in that time period. And that's why he became such a quick painter as he trained and trained and trained for that. And so it's that same idea, you just practiced over and over. I actually have another friend in the military and she does that during her lunch breaks. She'll ask someone to sit for her and she'll do 10 minute sketches and 10 minute portrait paintings and then ask someone else, 10 minute portrait painting. And she'll do that for her lunch break. And it's the way she can just get trained on that. Um, no matter how, and this is another thing that I want to point out too is, these guys are professional artists. They're doing this for a living and yet they still see that importance in practice. You can always learn more. And if you ever think you've arrived, that's actually where you stagnate. If you think you've, you've mastered all the art, that's actually the most detrimental thing that can happen to an artist, I think. Imposter syndrome is basically required. Steve was saying imposter syndrome is basically required. Most artists I've met have imposter syndrome. It's where, where they think that they're a fraud and one of these days everyone is going to figure it out. And then they'll never buy their pieces again. But it's that, that fear that keeps them going. Wait, yeah, I think I just saw nods on every head in here. And that's actually that drive that keeps them doing it, then keeping learning and pushing and pushing. That actually, if you want, if you're looking for something that's the gift for art, it's that. It's that drive and that desire to keep doing it and not stop and not, not be done. Even when something might not work out, your picture might not work out. Well, uh, a lot of times when I look at someone is, did you learn something? Did you have fun? At least you got that. And so that's how it'll go. And um, uh, every artist, I, I, I don't know exactly where this quote is from. I've heard Steve say it. Every artist has a lot of good drawings in them and a lot of bad drawings. Sadly enough, mostly the bad ones have to come first. But sometimes even as a professional, something might frustrate you and you're just not getting it down. Even they have those days where it's just like, ah, done. <laughs> What was that, Tom? I'm gonna do that. The uh, the road to success is paved in failure. Words of wisdom, thank you. No, it, it, but it's actually very true. Hi, Drew. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just like looking face to face. <laughs> it's gonna just be like just like my nose. Yeah. Um, but that's kind of true. You just gotta keep going and going, and that's that's the true talent is that effort and that push to keep going and not stop. Um, I feel like there should have been a rainbow and a star go across, woo! Now you know. You know. Um, when we come up on the break, which speaking of, we're at 27 minutes. When we come up on the break, before I actually give Sydney her break, I'm gonna torture her a little by doing an interview with her. So we can ask her actually a lot of these same questions because whether you're arting like this, 
or arting like that, it's art. And so a lot of people will be like, oh, I, I can't draw. Well, do you write? Do you compose music? Do you dance? Is there something you do that's creative in your life? It doesn't have to be art, but people need that creative outlet. So when I say, and I stole this by the way, copyright Drew Baker. When I say art makes life better, whatever your artistic outlet is, I think it's important to have one. So, and if you wanna give a go at something else, like hey, yeah, I'm really good at writing, I'm terrible at drawing, but I'm gonna try a little drawing. I love that adult coloring books are catching on because it's that release for people and people are finally starting to figure out, oh, being creative is just this release from my job. It's that, it's that outlet for everyone. And we actually do have people in the audience drawing. By the way, people in the audience, I want to see your pictures later. I don't know if there's a hashtag. Art makes life better is a hashtag. I, I don't know if the people in the stream can have a constant enough image of her to do, a, do that, but I do know that there's actually like two people at least in the audience right here that are drawing. Yeah. Where did you post yours the other night? All right. He put his on Instagram the other night. Maybe we'll get it to Sydney too and we can like repost. Sydney said, you could post a picture of her with Sydney said you could post a picture of her with the hashtag. Yeah. So we'll figure out that out, but I love seeing that. We're gonna let you guys draw our art for a little bit longer. I'm gonna put this down for one second. All right, they pointed out, and I'm sorry, I didn't realize this. I, I, I get lost. There's not like a good rotation on this group. Um, Aaron, I'm supposed. To, I need to ask you. And you, you actually did start yours a little different from everyone else. I noticed. Um, how do you start your portrait paintings? I don't know what I'm doing. I have no clue what I'm doing. <laughs> how did you decide to start this portrait painting? <laughs> I picked a dark color and made some mud and mushed it around in the right spots. How do you know it's the right spots? <laughs> yeah, you give me answers like that, I give you questions back, my friend. 
Okay, so I, I worked on large shapes, uh, mostly the silhouette, and a little bit of measuring, a little bit of measuring based on the shapes within the shapes, and, and then I started filling in with just shadows. I feel like a lot of paintings consist of a lot of darks and neutrals, so I just wanted to like kill the white of the board where I was going to be working, get a lot of neutrals, start kind of pushing some darks, and working up the lights, and I'll eventually get to the table. Sorry, he said I'll eventually get to vase. I pulled away for the second thing. So, how, when you start a commission, how do you start your commissions? I have no idea what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> wow, see, they're cheering you on. Aaron, I'm just warning you, you keep giving me answers like that, I'm gonna keep giving you questions like that. <laughs> uh, someone said, how's the imposter syndrome coming? So, yes. I'll answer it. So, if this was a commission, and the final result might be this layout, I would have sketched it in my uh, sketchbook like everyone else, sketchbook or on the computer, figured out the basic pose. I might, I might have used a, a toy or like a toy mannequin and posed it to see if, if this was the pose I would want to use for, with a model that I would hire. And if I was lucky enough, I would have a costume like this. If I wasn't, I would cobble it as ridiculous as possible and get close enough. I would photograph the model, I would photograph toys, I would photograph ornaments in the same light and then use them to inform the armor or the fabric or the tattoo or the hair. And I would then work on a drawing and then I would fix all my mistakes in the drawing, project the drawing on this panel, and then they'll start painting uh, from the drawing and, and the photos. So you don't, uh, so you don't uh, paint over your original drawing? I scan it and project it onto a panel uh, or canvas. Very cool. Thank you. You'll answer my questions after you, you give me two belligerent question answers. Is that it? Yeah. All right. At least I know the, the formula. All right. And yes, if I forget someone or miss someone, let me know. There's a lot of artists. It's so awesome. I'm so excited. We are 20 minutes left uh, until our hour break. You will see when Sydney's going throughout this, she'll sometimes just close her eyes. It's because, it's again what we talked about why you don't wear contacts. Sometimes you just have to close them. Just do that. Sometimes, if you're lucky, you can fall asleep in an awesome pose. Um, but usually it's actually just because your eyes are just aching. So you'll have, you have to close your eyes for a little bit. So uh, yeah, if you see her continuing to do that, this is why you don't wear contacts. <laughs> um, I'm actually going to come out. Audience, do you guys have any questions for the artists? We'll save the questions for the cosplayer a little later when we can have our interview with them. Does anyone have any questions for any of the artists? I can't go that far. I'm sorry, you have to come to me. Come to me. 
Hi. Hi. So you gotta get closer. I can, I can get him here. So question for Steve. So you say you've been doing a lot more sketching and everything on your phone and everything. Um, I've been trying to find a good app to use and like to sketch with. What do you prefer? Yeah, that's a great question. I'll actually even go around to ask on that. So thank you. Let's scooch back. Steve, what app are you using on your phone? Or, and you tested out a couple, didn't you, when you decided to do that? Uh, I did. I, I tested a handful. There's, um, there's the Photoshop one, which is okay. I actually was a little bit disappointed in it. So what I've been using that uh, I found the, the best for me, at least, was Autodesk Sketchbook. And uh, I'll show you some of the stuff I've done on it. But first, I'm going to make sure that I don't have anything up that I can't show you guys. He, he's done a lot of sketches on there, so it's like loading, loading. That makes it sound terrible, Steve. Yeah. Safe for career, not safe for work. So we'll see if we can get a little sketch on this. So this is something he did entirely on his phone. Zooming in and zooming out and doing little details. I don't know if we can get that. I guess you can get it a little. Where's my camera? You can do it. He's actually got it. A little. But we'll see how a digital screen shows up on a digital screen. OK. Oh, yeah, there. Nice. So that's just what he was working on. He works on those little thumbnails. It's very similar to what we had with Drew's. Um, yes, this one actually has this awesome little. So um, it comes with a little pen. Okay. Just pops in here and charges. This is the Galaxy Note 9. Yeah, Samsung. Steve is um, looking for some sponsorship here. Yeah, I need this pen. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's pressure sensitive and the stylus and the pen are by Wacom. I'm talking in a mic. And, yeah. But, um, but it's so, and that's actually, again, coming back to what I'm pointing out. Drew always has his sketchbook on him. He's always doing sketches. Always, always, always. Steve was starting to try to do that. He kept a sketchbook. He just wasn't actually doing much in it. But then he found, well, I'm going to get this phone. And instead of, he removed all of the phone games from his phone so that when he went to go, like, just naturally, I'm bored, I'm going to look at this, he instead started sketching. Because he, he actually, Drew's been an inspiration to us for a long time. He always does this. Howard Lyon shows a lot of his sketches and stuff like that. And so uh, it's something that I know Steve's been working and wanting to do. And so sometimes you like need to substitute habits if you want to make it something like that. I probably should do this too because uh, I, I play entirely. I, I just like waste time on Facebook or something. And so this is kind of a cool habit to substitute in instead. Doodle. Doodle the lady next to you on the grocery line. Hold still, ma'am. All right. So with that, um, actually, I know we talked about what people like to use, uh, the traditional mediums that they're using. But let's cover some digital here, too. Um, you do paint uh, digitally a bit. What are your, what's your, what's your preferred program? Uh, Photoshop for me, because I, I don't have, I don't have like a, an iPad or anything, so usually when I'm working I have like a Wacom Companion, which I don't even think they make anymore, but, uh, it's called something different, right? Isn't it, oh, okay, I thought it was like Mobile Studio or something now. Uh, okay, anyway, it's, it's basically a Wacom a tablet that is its own computer and uh, so I draw on that with Photoshop. All right, thank you Scott. All right, Aaron, do you mostly, you talked about a little digital here and there. Are you mostly uh, traditional or are you mostly digital? I've switched over to mostly traditional. I still do digital because uh, I love it. Um, I don't, I don't feel one is better than another. I just really enjoy painting personally. Um, so yeah, I, 
I'll do most of my commissions in oil if I can. All right, so when we talk digital, what uh, programs are you using? I use uh, Photoshop, mostly. Um, I'm going to be slowly experimenting, adding ZBrush uh, for reference. Um, I'll use SketchUp for structure reference and some perspective reference. Um, I've tried Poser for some character, just lighting reference on figures. Uh, I'm trying all sorts of stuff. I'll use toys um, in the same reason, the same for the same reasons I would use a 3D program. Posers, how you do your like your your 3D toys, the mock-ups, and everything like that. Uh, well, I just got it to work with um, on a small project, so I'm not really used to it. I'm used to either posing myself or or toys. I like it. Drew, I know you used to be more digital. Did you have a preference when you were more digital? Uh, I, just, I just used Photoshop. Usually whatever old version I had purchased. Uh, when they went to subscription model, I'm like, oh, this is garbage. I'm not doing that. All traditional now. That, that forced you to do more traditional. Um, uh, it's funny. I started learning to oil paint because I'd been using Photoshop 6. That's before CSs. Uh, and then they went to the dynamic brush engine. I thought, if I have to learn a new brush engine, I'll just learn to use brushes. <laughs> yep. And then your, prefer your preferred traditional medium is oil? Yeah, oil is my favorite. Oil is what I, I understand and sort of think in. Is that same with you, Aaron? Uh, your preferred traditional medium is uh, oil? Scott, also oil? It was interesting, the, other, the first night we did this, um, only two of them were in oils, a bunch of them were in acrylics, some of them had like inks too, it was really, uh, I'm, I'm more used to a lot of people using oils, but uh, yeah, they were using some other really... A lot of times if I'm doing, a lot of times if I'm doing, uh, not necessarily portrait stuff, but if I'm doing just like travel sketching or like plein air sketching live things, um, I, I have like a little watercolor set that I use because I like the quick washiness of that and it's, you know, easy cleanup. So um, for anybody that just like wants to do quick work, um, I recommend, you know, that. Or even just like, uh, even better is like watercolor pencils they make. They're like colored pencils, but they are water soluble. Um, drawing with those and then just getting one of those uh, water brush pens and just doing washes with that. I've done a ton of travel sketches with that stuff and it's great. Um, another one that I've seen was, um, oh gosh, what's his name? Dinotopia. Gurney, wow, everyone's on that. Jim Gurney does a cross between those two. He has, um, there's this Koi set where you can get a, like a 32 or a 15 color watercolor set. And it's this big, it travels really well. And then he just has one of those water pens. It's just got ink in it, or it's just got water in it. And he does quick watercolors on like little postcard size stuff. So that's his that's his quick sketch medium. Like how Drew's using his book or Steve's using his phone. His is like little like a little baby watercolor set. It's pretty cool. Um Steve gurneyjourney.com, yes. Uh Steve, you you're usually uh, what we, you started the digital discussion. What um, apps are you using on your computer? And then what's also your favorite traditional medium too? So for the computer, I use all kinds of weird things because I started there and I didn't actually start as an illustrator. I started in video games. So I use ZBrush, I use Maya, I use Photoshop of course is like 95% of it because you kind of build your reference with, uh, with ZBrush or Maya or um, you don't need those fancy things. There's, there's like Sculptress which I think is still free. There's Google SketchUp, there's, uh, there's Rhino, there's Moto, there's Blender, there's tons of ways. What you use. <laughs> Alright, I, I mostly use ZBrush and Maya. Uh, and Photoshop 95. And almost every the rest of it's in Photoshop. Traditional. What's your favorite traditional medium to work in? It's oftentimes mashed potatoes. Uh -huh. It's kind of a sculpty medium. I'm sure you're going to say Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, it's
All right, Tyler, are you digital at all? Uh, yeah, most of my career I've been digital. So. What programs do you use? Uh, I, I really like Corel Painter because it kind of simulates natural media uh, a little bit better than Photoshop, which is what a lot of my contemporaries were using when I was coming up. Um, yeah, but I hit a point where I realized I was finishing a piece in Painter and then I would take it into Photoshop to clean up and fix things. So recently I had kind of just given up on, on, on Painter and just doing everything in Photoshop. Um, but I also really, recently I picked up an iPad Pro and I've been using a program called Clip Studio Paint, uh, which is actually designed for like doing comics and manga and stuff. Uh, but it's got a lot of really good painting tools in it. So I, and I absolutely adore working on my iPad. Like all of the pieces I have, I recently did a bunch of uh, uh, Critical Role character art and yeah. I, all of those were done 100% on my iPad sitting in my recliner, which was awesome. Because you get to be with people, which, <laughs> like, I can see my family and do work at the same time. What? Yeah. Uh, kind of awesome. That's cool. All right. Tom, I know you are actually are very, you're usually are traditional. Do you use digital at all? Uh, I actually do. Um, lately, I've, uh, I've actually been using a lot of uh, digital. I've been doing about 50% 50 digital, 50% uh, 50 digital, 50 traditional as of late. Uh, and the, tradi uh, the digital that I've been using uh, is just like Tyler said. I've actually been using um, my iPad Pro and uh, using the program uh, Procreate on my iPad Pro. So just for the exact same reasons Tyler was talking about, I can sit and hang out with my family or my friends and still get some work done. Uh, and the other really great thing about Procreate is that it, uh, it replicates traditional media uh, really wonderfully. Uh, it's almost like working in gouache, where if I keep the layers flattened and I'm not using any tricks really with, uh, with brushes or, or smudge tools or blur tools, uh, it's exactly like working uh, in, in a traditional medium. Very cool. And then what do you usually, when you use traditional mediums, what are you usually working in? Yeah, when I use traditional mediums, it's almost always oil paints, yep. How many times have you mixed up your, uh, your clean, brush cleaning and, and your cup of water? Uh, about once a day. Never have to go to the hospital? Uh, surprisingly, no, but uh, there's always a uh, first. Tyler, did I ask you what, when you work traditionally what you like to work in? You did not. Uh, no, you didn't. I, I really enjoy, for quick stuff, uh, working in gouache. Um, I'm a little out of practice for that. Uh, recently, I've been doing most of my stuff with oils. So, yeah, all the fin like finished paintings, finished illustrations, mostly oils. Is there a reason you pick oils over other things? Uh, yeah, you know, I spent about two years um, kind of trying to transition from digital to traditional, and I tried everything. I could try all of, all of the different mediums I could. Like, this style looks cool, maybe that's me. Uh, so I played around with wash, I played around, I tried airbrush and colored pencils for a while. Like, that's what uh, Drew Struzan does, all his amazing movie posters with. Uh, and I'm a huge fan of his work, so I thought, well, I'll try that. Um, yeah, so I, I tried lots of different things to varying degrees of success. How long ago were you trying all this out? Um, it's it's been in the last few years that I've been doing all that. So I guess this is something I want to pu uh, push home. Is Tyler's been a professional artist for a long time, but he's still playing around and changing and honing the craft. So even professionals are still trying new mediums and, and working through things to see what they might enjoy. That's part of the reason I'm doing the interviews like this. Maybe one's not working for you, try another. So anyway, keep going. Uh, well, I was gonna say, it, so at the end of the day, it turned out that working with oils was most similar to how I work digitally. Because I, I guess, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. So, so since it, because I had for years tried to like work in as few layers of, as possible. So I was essentially trying to work like a painter, even though I was, I was scared of the materials, y'all. <laughs> like I just didn't, I just didn't want to make that leap. Um, but it's yeah, it's 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 can be scary to make those steps, but that's how you grow. Thank you.
All right, we've got two minutes left. We're going to let these guys just paint as much as they can before that first hour break. have our first hour break. I just started the clock again. You got about uh, 10 minutes, but I'm going to hijack you for a couple minutes to do a call, uh, some interviews. And we will check also with the audience if they have any questions for you also. So uh, I'm going to steal my little cheat sheet here. I had another cheat sheet. I lost it. It's no longer here. Anyway. Hi. Hi. Hi, everybody. All right. So again, I'd like to introduce you all to uh, Tappy Toe Claws, a.k.a. Sydney. A.k.a. Thirsty. <laughs> a.k.a. Super Thirsty. And um, so I'm going to ask some similar questions to what we asked the artist. When you're approaching a cosplay, how do you start? Where, where, do, where do you start with on a, what do you start with on a cosplay? What do you focus on? Uh, definitely start with a plan and a design that's way more ambitious than you have the skill or the time to make and schedule at least three breakdowns uh, in the process. One of which, yes, yeah, whatever kind of breakdown you wanna have. I mean, if you wanna have like a beat breakdown, that's probably good too. Um, I mean, one of those breakdowns might happen in the hotel room when you're putting it on, but I mean, that's- And when it starts to fall apart. Yeah, uh, realistically, what you actually wanna do is like, you're putting a ton of time of effort in, like, you're basically just gonna sink a ton of your time, a ton of your effort, and a not insubstantial amount of money into whatever you're doing. So if you're going to make a costume, please make sure that you make a costume that you want to make. You have to love this thing, because no one else is going to love it as much as you have to, to want to make it happen. Uh, so you have to be like your own biggest fan. You have to be like more enthusiastic than literally anybody else is about this. Um, and that's the best way to do it, because you'll also then enjoy like having done it a lot more. You can look back on it, you can look back on all your like pictures, and you can be as psyched as you possibly can about it. Um, as far as like the way to actually do it, um, what, what I generally do when I have a costume is like once I've already decided what bad choice I'm going to make and committed to it, uh, you break it down into parts and you want to try to figure out what parts kind of need to be done in the same way. So like figure out what all the fabric parts are and figure out what all the foam and the armor parts are and then figure out what all the makeup and other business kind of is. Um, and then if like you are really terrified to do foam or to do armor, you should probably do that first. Uh, the best advice I ever got was to fail faster. 
So if you're really, really terrified of trying armor work, because you've never done it before, do that first. Because if you need to be Ralz Eric and you need to have this and all this business, make sure that that's the part that you start on first. That so that if, if, if you're not able to do that one key point, then, well, you figured it out before... Or not even necessarily to, like, be able to quit, but to be able to be like, oh, I screwed that up and I need to give myself, like, an extra two weeks to try this part again or whatever. Uh, YouTube is also a wonderful, wonderful resource. Um, there's tons of cosplayers that put up, like, a, some amazing tutorials and stuff that way. Um, any of us magic cosplayers, obviously, if you're here, you probably like magic, but uh, if you have any questions about how we've ever made anything, like, we're just a tweet away. Um, sometimes it takes me a while to respond to my tweets because I'm, you know, at an event here and I can't move for two hours. <laughs> you mean you didn't respond to the tweet I sent you ten minutes ago? I... I'm not going to respond to it even in the future. Oh. All right. Um, what is your favorite part in building a costume? Different people have their specialties. What is your favorite part in building a new cosplay? Uh, I spent eight hours on this wig because uh, you hand tie in all this fabric and you kind of have to like that to be able to hate yourself enough to do that. I also like turning my face into a gross man. So makeup is a really fun thing that I really enjoy. I can't wait to see what these wonderful artists did of like all this weird stuff that I put on my own face. So I, yeah, uh, my favorite part is kind of makeup and wigs and weird stuff like that. I love putting stuff into wigs. Um, I like putting weird horns and crazy braids and a lot of other weird hair and stuff. All right, I know this is a little weird, but I know with artists, they'll have like a favorite little piece of their, their picture and they like want to be like, this is my favorite right here. Show us on this cosplay, what is your favorite? Like, what is that piece you just want to show everyone? So this harness is the weirdest thing that my girlfriend has ever made. Uh, this was actually a, a, a costume that was sponsored by Wizards. So like they were like, hey, what if you were Rel Zarek and came to PAX and did this for the Guild of Ravnica promo? And that was cool. And that was a rare opportunity where like we got so many reference images and all these wonderful kind of like three-dimensional things. We got the full breakdown of like the tattoo and what this looks like, like flat in like two dimensions. It's really, really nice. Uh, I, I don't want to tell you that you'll always have that to make a costume because most of the times you're going to have a picture that's this big and you just have to figure out how to make an entire costume out of that. Um, but we looked at this at this harness and it's got all these straps on it and most of them don't do anything but we made every single one of these straps and by me I mean my girlfriend uh, she's a much better seamstress than I am she did most of it and then when War of the Spark was released there's a picture where Ral has his gauntlet strapped to his to his like thing to it right here and we have that strap on here and that artist like had the strap and the gauntlet it doesn't I didn't know they the found a use like for it but it literally that's what it was there for and we had it from like a year before and it's the dumbest thing but I love the fact that this has so many extra straps and that they apparently all have a purpose that is awesome thank you so much um advertise yourself a little tell us uh where to find you on social media and everything like that yeah, my hair really straight um so I am Tappy Toe Claws on Twitter. I'm a loud dinosaur from the internet. Um, I'm also on Instagram, and I stream sometimes, but uh, my condo actually hates my internet, so I haven't streamed for a while. But um, yeah, so Instagram, Twitter, and Twitch, if you're feeling like you're gonna get lucky one day randomly. All right, I'll let you take your break. Thank you so much. Looks like you've got five minutes left, all right? Thank you. You do your thing. All right, Rashad, I'm putting this down.
I told Rashad to turn it off. He'll get it back. There we go. Rashad, you're awesome. Thank you. Yep. Getting some water for Tom. Hey, Tom. All right, so we got it. Uh, we, we came back a little late from our break. There was some technical difficulties. <laughs> Nothing to see here. Um, so we got 43 minutes till our next break. Uh, we'd like to welcome everyone back. We are here in the Pastimes Magic area at Gen Con 2019. We are so excited to be here, having a good time. We have uh, Scott Murphy. He is table number 16 in the artist area. We have Steve Argyle. He is booth number 571 outside of the artist area. We have Drew Baker. He is also booth 571 outside of the artist area. We have Tyler Walpole, art show booth number 19. Tom Babbitt, booth 13 in the art show. And last but not least, we have Aaron Miller, art show number 12. You'll notice they're all right by each other. You can just walk down that one aisle and get most of the people here. So uh, when we talk about that too, and we'll, we'll follow up on this a little later, some of these portraits that they're painting tonight might be for sale.
tomorrow at their areas in uh, the art show. So we'll follow up on that a little later once they kind of see more how their paintings are coming along. Um, something we've been pushing again and again is sometimes it just might not be working out and they're not happy with it so they don't want to sell it. So we'll check with them on that a little later. <laughs> Break it in half over your knee. <laughs> And uh, again, we'd like to thank Pastimes Games for giving us this space, um, setting this all up and supporting us. Alan just made this happen. And uh, last but not least, Sydney or Tappy Toe Claws. Yay! For modeling for us. All right. So we asked it of Sydney. We're going to start asking some of the artists. We're going to get personal with the artists. We're going to get in depth. No. Mostly, I'm going to ask, where do we find you on the internet? So, uh, let's start with Scott. Scott, where do we find you on the internet? Uh, internet for me is a uh, website uh, is murphyillustration.com. Uh, Instagram is Murphy Illustration, and uh, Facebook is just me, Scott Murphy. But it's mostly art stuff. So follow me or friend me or whatever. Um, I pretty much stick to those three because they're the most efficient. All right, coming on back. Aaron, where do we find you on the internet? AaronBMiller.com. Straight, simple, nice, I like it. Anything else? Uh, my Twitter at Aaron Draws. Um, Instagram is Aaron Miller. And I, I think that's all that, there are all the other accounts linked together. All right, sounds good. Drew. Where do we find you online? Oh, when I'm online, I'm usually lurking on forums or Facebook. So we have to stalk you down to talk to you and find new things. Or, or if you want to see me post art, that's on Instagram at Drew Baker Art. Thanks, Drew. Steve, where do we find you on the internet? SteveArgyle.com is easy. I'm on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And mostly I forget what little weird things are which, so it's just just do a search. It's not exactly Steve Argyle at Twitter or whatever, but it's something like that. It's like Steve.Argyle. Close enough. All right, coming around to you, Tyler. Tyler, if we wanted to internet stock you, where would we go first? Uh, TylerWalpole.com is my website. Uh, I'm pretty active on Twitter these days. Um, at, oh, at Tyler Walpole. Uh, I'm also on Instagram. If you just search for Tyler Walpole, that's the easiest. All right. Thank you. Tom, where do we find you on the internet? Uh, TomBabby.com, and on Instagram, you can find me under TomBabby. That's very straightforward. Well, thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Since I'm here, we'll start our next round of questions this away, so that I don't have to go back around. Tom, where are you from? Uh, I'm based out of San Diego, California. How long you been there for? Oh man, uh, for a total of maybe 15 years or so. That's a pretty good art scene, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it is. I actually uh, I attended and uh, teach at an art school out there, a little north of San Diego proper, uh, just up the coast, Watts Tillier, the art. So. Uh, that's where I did most of my training, and uh, I still do my training there. I do a lot of figure drawing, life drawing, portrait painting there, as well as teaching. Very cool. Thank you. Tyler, where are you from? I'm from Des Moines, Iowa. Very nice. Whenever I hear that come up, I actually always think of you whenever Iowa comes up. I have a friend that lives there. <laughs> yeah. How long have you been in Iowa? Uh, born and raised, and I'm old, so a long time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's the answer. All right. Here comes the mic. <laughs> the mic is nice to you, Drew. Drew, where are you from? Uh, I live in the farmlands of western New York State. Uh, I was. Yeah, I was born in Utah, but moved out there, and that's where I became a person. <laughs> All right. S 
Steve Argyle, where are you from? Uh, I'm from Salt Lake City. It's fun. There's not much to talk about. All right. Scott? I am in Turner's Falls, Massachusetts, which is a tiny town just about uh, 20 minutes south of the Vermont border, out way out west in Massachusetts. How long you been there? Uh, about two and a half years now, but before then I was in New York City for about nine years. That's a pretty good art scene. How are, you, are you missing that at all when you're moving out to more quiet space? Um, sometimes, yeah. There's definitely elements of being in the city, uh, you know, going to the Society of Illustrators, going to all the great museums, but I'm still only like three hours away, so we go back once a month or so and, and visit. So I'm good. I'm happy. It's not as nearly as expensive where I am and not nearly as hectic, so I can actually enjoy my painting. Not going to have a heart attack at a young age. That's how I always felt in New York. I love the feel of New York, but I don't know if I could live there because I just feel like I'd have a heart attack at, you know, under 40. All right. Aaron, where are you from? So I'm from Chicago. Chicago? I don't even hear an accent. Uh, we don't all have accents. Wait, what? <laughs> what? No, I'm just giving you crap, dude. Um, how long you been in Chicago? Ooh, I was born there. I didn't always live there, so I would say 40 years. All right, very cool. Question? <laughs> I'm Ron Burgundy. <laughs> He's practicing for Jeopardy. He's going to always answer me in a question. All right. Uh, Tom brought this up a little, but uh, we're going to go back around and maybe ignore Tom. No, we're going to let him uh, expound upon the subject. Uh, what schooling did you guys do, if any, for art, or, or yeah, what what led up to this this choice of life that you guys have made? Uh, I guess. <laughs> Please let us know the road you followed to get down here, so we can avoid it. No. All right. So, uh, Aaron, do where did what did you do for school? Did you go to school for artwork, or what did you do? I went to the American Academy of Art, and that's what I did. But um, it only got me so far, and I didn't understand how to get where I wanted to go. So when, and also computers were starting to come into the market. So I taught myself how to use a computer and fell into design work, and then decided I actually wanted to be an illustrator. So started over and started over by going to workshops which filled in all the gaps that school did not provide thank you scott did you go to school for art yes i did uh i went to the hartford art school um which is actually one uh, the oldest art school in the country um for undergrad and uh, I also went back there several years later and did my master's, um, both in illustration. Uh, yeah. So I know once we talked, uh, we talked one time, and you were doing some stuff where you were actually going to like different cities and doing different paintings in different cities. What was that? Uh, that was that was part of the grad program that I did, which was limited residency. Um, so that was basically what happened um, was. Instead of going to a grad program where I'm living there as a full-time student again, uh, we met, uh, you know, for contact periods they called them. So it was basically two weeks in Hartford uh, for three summers, and then every um, fall and spring we would go to a different city for a week. Uh, so we did New York, we did um, San Francisco, we did. Texas, uh, Houston area, and then we did, uh, thinking of what the last one was, can't remember, but uh, four different kind of areas with different illustration 
environments, backgrounds, um, and we'd have a week of lectures and museum visits and all this stuff. And so, so there's a lot of just like getting out in the world and seeing what other illustrators are doing and how they're working. So that was a lot of fun. And then so I would basically be going back home after that and working on my thesis and all my other stuff kind of on my own time, which was great because I was also working on magic and I was working on other illustration projects. So do you get a lot of inspiration from those outside things too, the reference and stuff? That'd be awesome. That, 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 when you told me you did that, it sounded like the coolest way to learn. Great. All right, Drew, did you go to art school? Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> and? Then after a decade of recovering from art school, I learned to draw again. The end. <laughs> and now you're here. But, but it's not the end. I also um, continued to take, well, started to take workshops, uh, studying first at, uh, at the IMC, Art IMC, I think it's, it's uh, branded now. It was the Illustration Masterclass. And uh, yeah, I think most, some of us may have met there. Um, but that taught me how to do my illustrations in oils, how to control media well enough to do that. And then after I had reached that level, uh, I started taking workshops with um, other painters, sort of fine art painters. Like, uh, I took a workshop with Stephen Assail and Robert Liberace and Michelle Dunaway and Susan Lyon, and there are more uh, to, to try to learn to make paintings, uh, which is different than making, you know, an image for reproduction. So I, I try still to take a workshop every year to to learn more things and to to expand my skills. Professionals are still learning. Again, to punch that home. It's something you never end, you never finish doing, even the professionals, and I love it. It makes me so happy. All right, Steve, did you go to school for art? I did not. I, uh, I basically learned art when I was in school, uh, supposed to be doing other things and doodling in my notebooks. Uh, I would draw comic book heroes and stuff like that when I was supposed to be taking chemistry notes. And so, yeah, I'm, uh, I mean, I don't want to say self-taught, it's like that whole weird thing, but uh, when I started taking it seriously, I did a lot of the same things like what Drew was talking about. Uh, went to the, uh, the Illustration Master class, um, I think that's where I met half of these folks. Hold on, let me check on this. Scott, did you go to Illustration Master class? Aaron? Drew? Tom? Illustration Master class? Tyler? Oh, he had kids. You mean that actor you hire to pretend to be your son? <laughs> we give him crap. I think most of us met at IMC. Before. I don't know, Steve, had you done magic stuff when you first went? So I, I guess the Illustration Masterclass was a little bit into my career already, because I went because uh, one of the special guests was Jeremy Jarvis, and I was already working with him. Uh, but I was just like, he's too cool to not want to hang out with and pick his brain for a week. Um, oh, but I did do, so I did do workshops before I started working professionally though. Like, uh, I don't know if they even do them anymore, but they did the Noman workshop uh, live. And uh, I met, and this was like in 2005 or four. Um, I met Brom there, I met Stefan Martinier there, um, I met uh, Madeline Spencer Scott, I met like a whole bunch of people who at the time and still today are these just powerhouses. And they all were given lectures and it was a small little workshop of maybe 45 people and so you really got a lot of time to, to talk to these guys and they, they gave you advice that you, you don't hear. Uh, like, like uh, a lot of times when people ask you about how to how to become an artist or whatever, it's very, well, here's how to learn color theory. Here's how to learn how to do your foundational uh, stuff like that. But they were like, here's how to how to do things professionally. Here's how to get contacts. Here's how to separate yourself from the pack. Here's how to develop a style that's you know like it was stuff that it's that upper level stuff that. It's just, it, at least at the time, it was really hard to find that information. It's not as bad these days, but it's still not really taught. Very nice. Thank you. All right. Coming around to Tyler. Actually, we'll start with Tom on that.
All right, Tom, did you go to school for art? Well, yeah, you already actually answered part of this. I'm sorry. Yep. So, uh, yeah, I did go to school for art. Uh, I actually started going uh, uh, two years at a community college uh, after I graduated high school. And then I moved out to the University of Arizona and started taking art courses there for one semester and learned that nobody was teaching me with the stuff I wanted to be taught. Uh, so I stopped taking classes and I started looking at smaller schools that could actually teach me how to be an illustrator. Uh, so schools that actually had illustrators, people doing what I wanted to do working there. Uh, and I found a school in California in San Diego, the Watts Tilly of the Arts. And I moved out to San Diego and started taking classes there and still do to this day. Very nice. So sometimes it might just be like if, if you're not getting what you need, maybe yeah. check some other stuff out. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. If you're not finding what you need in, uh, in a particular area, there's always resources out there to kind of give you what... Um, what your skills need to get better. So uh, don't be constrained to those boxes. Get outside the box and kind of move outside your comfort zone and find what you need. Steve, Steve's a college uh, art teacher and just like one of the art 101s told Steve he would never succeed as an artist. Oh yeah, I got that too. Yeah, in high school I had a, uh, a high school art teacher who said that I was the worst student she ever had and that I should give up art. So, uh, and here I am. <laughs> And they're probably still teaching high school? They, they are, they're still teaching high school art. <laughs> I had something of the opposite experience with my uh, art school teachers. One of them said I was one of the sons he never had. Uh, uh, and delayed retirement to be my senior advisor. Aww. And then, kept you, and then did he kidnap you and keep you in his basement? Because that seems to be where this is going. <laughs> Drew? No, I, I betrayed them all. They thought I had a, a career in galleries, and uh, now I draw Jedi and samurai and dragons. And, yeah. Oh, we're looking at time here, but let me ask Tyler this uh, last question. Um, actually, if you guys wanted to see the stream, but we're about to end, but that's where we were streaming, right over there. Yeah. All right, so... Did you go to school for art, Tyler? Uh, nope, not at all. I uh, kind of like what Steve was saying. I, I don't like the term self-taught because uh, what I did was I just I practiced a lot and shared my artwork with other artists. I used to hang out on the uh, conceptart.org forums and would get lots of feedback from uh, people that were better than me. Um, yeah, so it's just a matter of you know, just doing it over and over and failing, probably, hopefully failing in a new and different way than you did last time and fixing the previous problems. Um, but uh, like these other guys, I started doing a lot of workshops when I can. Um, I like, I also like to try and do at least one a year if I can. Uh, I did one at the Watts Atelier um, when Chris Ron was their guest artist. Um, yeah, if you ever had a chance to paint with Chris Ron for a week, you should do that. Um, same with uh, Howard Lyon was painting at uh, um, Jeff Miracola's workshop recently. So I went to that for a week because that's how you get better is you paint with people who are working at a level you want to be working at. Um, I actually found that um, a little bit in, uh, I know Steve went to high school with a bunch of people and all of those guys are professional artists now, which, which seems so weird because it's like this group, this tight knit group that are now professional artists and I think it's because they challenged each other and pushed each other like that. Well, I, I was just going to say, I think it's a lot like martial arts. You, you need to, it's a complex skill that you need to learn from people who are better than you and you need to put the time into it and you need to find the right culture to fit into. Yep, and I like I was saying, I think that that's why I've seen that before, uh, where you, you find these clumps of people who went to school together and all seem to succeed. And I, I believe, I mean, sometimes it is a little bit who you know, but I think that it's that challenge of all your friends around you that you're lifting each other up and making each other better. Um, another thing I wanted to kind of bring the bring to light with all of this is that uh, if you check this all out. People have different backgrounds. They went to different types of schools. They went to, uh, they, they all learned in different ways. Uh, sometimes I think that a school is needed. Personally, I'm one of those people that has to be in a classroom. And, and that gets me to put in that time and have that interaction. 
And uh, that's how I learn, and that's how I, I really am challenged. But sometimes other people with like Steve and uh, Tyler, where they do better on their own and they are challenging themselves and pushing themselves. They come home from work and then put another four hours in on just their personal stuff. And they'll challenge themselves in that way and continue to succeed as an artist in that way. And so uh, I, I think that it, it really depends on you and your learning environment. So keep that in mind. on the other people's work. Gosh, true. Oh, oh, did you? Sydney just, <laughs> all right. Well, it turns out, so we're coming up on the end of the Twitch stream. So sorry, we got that to you a little late, but uh, we're coming up on the end of the Twitch stream. So we want to just say goodbye to the Twitch streamers. We're going to keep streaming here. We got another 20 minutes left in this hour and then we'll do the last hour. Uh, so we just want to say goodbye to our friends on Twitch. We want to again thank Pastimes Games and uh, the, uh, their hosting of this magic area. We want to thank all of our artists here. Scott Murphy, Steve Argyle, Drew Baker, Tyler Walpool, Tom Babby, Aaron Miller, and Tappy Toe Claws. Thank you. All right, and good night to the Twitch stream. We love you guys.